uses data science methods to quantify determinants of success in different fields, such as uh, science of success in business, uh, success in the future of work, and quantifying success online and offline. I suspect we'll touch on bits of that uh, in the talk and the questions today. Uh, logistically, we're going to have a talk for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have some discussion at the end. If you're joining us online, please make sure that you put your questions in the uh, Q&A box. Those of you in the room, please, if you can save your questions till the end, and we'll do the other thing, obviously, put up your hands. Um, just for everybody's awareness, be aware that we are recording the talk, and it'll be on our website following the event. Um, so I think with that, I guess the only thing I will note is that we will try and make sure we have the whole hour. Um, so we probably will finish at about 10 to 3, but obviously if you need to slip out a little bit before then, please, please feel free to do so. But Fabian, thank you so much for doing this. I'm really, really delighted to hear your research. Thank you so much, Vicky, for the introduction. And um, thank you for all being here and also people online, obviously. I'm glad to see many familiar faces, also a few unfamiliar faces. And I hope to convey to you this interesting research project and that brought about some findings we um, were kind of maybe intuitively thinking they might be there, but that we could now show in a quantitative manner what you can see here, that there is a certain impact of founder personalities and startup success. So before we start, thank you, Vicky, you mentioned a few words about myself, but just very briefly about this research so that you get an understanding of where this all fits in the larger research landscape. So we all know we live in a times of big data, AI, machine learning, and so on and so forth. And this is all allowing us to quantify various aspects of the human interactions of the social system in a way that could have been quantified in the past in natural systems. This all is um, being reflected here in some way as we see the rise of um, novel fields called like ours, uh, the quantification of the science of success. And you see this in various other aspects called computational social science, social data science, complex system science. This is all one kind of large interconnected field of various different aspects that all try to quantify in different ways how um, human interactions, how the social system works and functions in order to make it a predictive, almost natural science kind of um, um, quantitative scientific field that um, will reveal all these various interactions. And this is um, just one piece into this, um, into this research field on the quantification of success. So coming to our study here, I can actually navigate. Yeah, so this is what I'm presenting um, to you today, uh, our paper, is, um, has been published in October. We were very happy to see that our paper trying to understand the impact of founder personalities of, on success actually was successful too, in the sense that we got more than 50,000 people who kind of read or downloaded this paper. So um, great um, impact so far. And these are my co-authors. So we had uh, Paul um, McCarthy from um, Sydney. We had Elaine also in Sydney, myself, Fabian Stefani, colleague here from the Oxford Internet Institute, and then two other researchers uh, from Australia too, Marianne and Margaret and Kerner, kind of famous psychologist. So before we actually come to our results, I would like to ask you, as you have seen the title, the impact of founder personalities on startup success. I would like to ask you all, in your view, what do you think? What determines startup success? So what could be element that play a role in shaping the success of a startup company. Of course, also people online, feel free to add your comments here. I would like to ask you, what comes to your mind? Longevity. Longevity. Longevity of the founders or longevity of, of the company? company. <laughs> <laughs> of the company, yes. So in, in the sense that company Continue. needs some time and continues to be in business determining success. Yes. So time element, let's say this. Any other ideas Tom. successful financial outcomes really good yes yeah. so financial outcomes and what would you have in mind then uh, in, in terms of startups it's often the, the transaction and exit process is the selling of the company yeah and if that is over a certain threshold that could probably be considered successful so really more the definition of success i wanted to ask you in a minute anyway what is success so you're saying like an exit event Yes, so absolutely an exit event often is being looked at as something like either the company was acquired by another company, so the founders could sell actually their shares to um, whoever acquired the company, or the company acquired another one, so kind of obviously is growing rapidly and taking over other firms, or the other scenarios in IPO, like the company goes public, which is um, the one exit scenario that most 
uh, VCs, most venture capital companies would be looking at and would just kind of traditionally looked at success. This is also the definition we used, but maybe on the kind of fact of that play a role to establishing this form of success or any other form of success, what comes to your mind? Culture of the startup? You can say it again. The culture of the style. The culture of the style, yes. Yeah, so in the sense that how the companies may be run in the beginning, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of talk around a more inclusive, more dynamic, more agile kind of a project management system. This clearly is one factor, yes. Impact. Imp wow. Impact. Yeah. The impact, the impact of the, the impact of the community. Impact. Yes, so another form of also how the company could then engage with whatever they had in mind. Yes, we had a hand here. I was also going to say social impact. Social impact, yeah, Marianne. Location of the countries. Location, yeah. In what what sense? Which kind of location do you have in mind? Then? Just from reading the paper, looking at different startups in different countries, um, ones in the United States, you see are they in a rural area, a more urban area? How does that affect being able to get their product out? Yes, yes, absolutely. So where is the company based? And there was one more hand, I believe. Yeah. IP. IP. Mm -hmm. So in the sense of what did they actually develop, right? What is it that they uh, produced? But it could be quantified via patents. Yes. Um, or other means uh, and identify it as a innovative first of its kind idea. Yes, absolutely. So we're hearing there is a various number of different aspects that all need to be taken into consideration in some aspect, in one or the other aspect. So we have clearly something related to what is the company actually producing? What kind of impact might they have? What is it related to the um, leadership style maybe within the company? Or um, we heard about financial outcomes, but also I would like to say the financial endowment, the access to financial means, all of this may be accumulated in the sense that company being in different locations, having access to different ecosystems might all play a role. And this actually needs to be taken into consideration. And with regards to success, we heard about impact um, the uh, social effect the company might have on the community, the financial output in terms of revenue or these um, exit events. This is, again, the definition we used. And here we want to just briefly look at from the data set we have been looking at what are kind of traditional determinants of success and how do they vary across these various dimensions. So just looking at the geographical component, what we see here is countries in different shades. Darker green means share of successful companies is higher. Lighter green means lower share of successful companies. And little surprise, we see quite a bit of clustering, quite a bit of inequality there across the globe, which is partly obviously also due to the very data set we have used, which is a US-based company that lists all these various startups but clearly we see the us is leading which isn't surprising to us in the sense that silicon valley is in the us and obviously the whole venture capital startup ecosystem really comes from from there but there's a few other countries of course western europe north um, and central europe we have india here particularly pronounced in this particular data set as well as other countries in asia not much data being covered unfortunately from global south countries this is a limitation that our study has and that all these um analysis of startup ecosystems obviously have there is just much less data available unfortunately and the bias that needs to be addressed too on the other hand obviously something we haven't talked about so far is the industry so there's various different fields in which you could be active obviously with your startup company independently of which technologies you might apply and quite obviously there's a few companies a few industries part of the economy where this exit oriented form of success we have been looking at plays a bigger role than in others. So among our industries here from the data set with privacy and security, payments and other kind of IT related sectors to be among those that had the highest shares of successful companies and others that had lower shares of successful companies in agriculture and farming. This could also just reflect not the fact that companies in these sectors are not successful in any way, this is not what we want to imply, but obviously maybe exit scenarios might play a lower role in these kind of industries. And another one we heard about longevity, maybe of the founders, but clearly, definitely also for the companies themselves. So there is different market environments. So companies that have been founded in the early years of our observation period, that is in the 90s and early 2000s, they might have, have, might have had less competition for venture capital. So there is clearer, higher share of companies that have been successful in this time. Also, obviously, they had just more time to become successful. Obviously, it takes some time until you will have had an impact in your market, have had the time to develop all these various patterns. So this is traditional measures that have been looked at. Location, capturing the startup ecosystem and all the various differences that come to it might be the tax um, system in particular countries, might be the overall network or culture in, towards business, industries, and time. 
However, obviously, this should not be our focus here. We are more interested in the founders. So if you just think now for a minute about the founders themselves, so taking all this for given, what would you think in terms of the individual founders themselves? What could their influence the success of companies, uh, the, the success of these startups? Yes. Gender. Gender, yes, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> this is an important component, yeah? Tom? I mean, experience partly operationalized through age, probably. The experience of the founders, yes. Nubia? Uh, their character traits. Character traits, yes, exactly. This is <laughs> what we're here to learn about. Yes, <laughs> something we want to capture. Maybe other things as well. Of the experience, uh, their connections in the industry. Connections in the industry, yes. So their social capital, absolutely. Experience, we could also maybe summarize this as human capital. Any other viewpoints? Any other perspectives? Education. Education, yes, like a hard skill in the sense. Future vision. Future vision. So yeah, what they actually would want to do, maybe, what they would want to achieve. Yeah. And Tom and Will. Individual with financial capital, how much money can they bring in themselves? Yes, absolutely. They all play a role clearly, and they have been, yeah. Marital status. But yeah, obviously. Maybe and all the other personal characteristics of individuals for sure. So this obviously has been due to the fact that startups and business success is of such a high importance for those people who actually start these companies, but obviously also for the finance industry as well as for the overall um, economies in themselves. There has been loads of research on all these various factors in different aspects. So, for example, research has looked as education and human capital as one important driver. Obviously, is it that there's particular types of schools, particular types of degrees, particular types of subjects that tend to be associated more with success of um, startup? Then the big question of hard skills were the soft skills in the sense that do you need the engineer, do you need the scientist, or is it sufficient if you have people who understand business in the sense? Also, networks and social capital, a very fascinating study published in the same journal as ours, has looked into quantifying the access new companies have, thanks to their founders, thanks to their CEOs and other executive team, to the larger startup ecosystem, and obviously also individual personality traits. And all of this needs to be taken into consideration. But I think what our study does, um, building on top of all these other findings already, complementing some of these findings, but also building on top of them, again, thanks to the large data set that are these days available, we investigate the effect of the personality combinations of the complete founder team, obviously also the individual founder traits um, of the startups in more than 21,000 companies, taking all of this into consideration, which is important because if you don't do this, you would assign the... Um, it added value or the added contribution to success, you would just assign it to the personality traits or the personality combinations or the gender, whatnot, if you leave away all these other factors. So before we come to a brief summary of what we found, I just wanted to briefly outline to you the methodology we have been looking at. So we started with one data set. Again, this comes with limitations, but we had to start somewhere. We used data from Crunchbase. Has any one of you heard of Crunchbase? See many, many nods and raising it. Hands raised. Um, who wants to say a word about it? What is Crunchbase? What does it cover? It looks at companies and the funding that is behind them. Yes. What, what investments have been made over what series of... Um... Yes, absolutely. So it is maybe, if you want to summarize it, it is more or less like LinkedIn, but for companies. And companies have an incentive, startup firms have an incentive to be on this platform because it is then much easier for venture capital companies, for VCs to um, just mm -hmm. see them, look at them. So it's a bit like a digital business card if you want to look at this. Obviously, there's, again, all these various biases that come with the data set, but we just have to take what we could get there. So what we did, we used this data set. It lists more than 1 million companies and also more than 1 million individuals related to startups, not only founders, but also investors, advisors, board members, and so on and so forth. So we looked for company founders only. And then in order to infer the personality, obviously we couldn't ask all of them, please tell us your personality or please answer these various questions um, from a survey. So we had to infer this using another kind of big data tool. We went for data on Twitter, now X. We searched for those founders who first of all had a Twitter account linked to their Crunchbase profile and then who made enough kind of comments or statements or tweets on Twitter so that we could infer the personality. Without going into too much detail, the way it works really is it takes all these texts and um, 
natural language processing tool that are readily available these um, this time online, they can not only tell you what the sentiment is, is it like a positive sentence or negative sentence, but they could also give you more information. Among others, they can help you to infer the personality traits. And these personality traits are roughly as good as if you ask close friends or spouses of these people. So this has been looked at with various kind of pre-chain data sets to understand how good is this actually. It's not as good as the gold standard, which would be like the lengthy 300 question survey that you could use in um, psychological studies. But for the sake of the argument for what we want to do, it's good enough. You want to do? Yes. Uh, why Twitter and why not LinkedIn, for example? We would have loved to use LinkedIn. However, unfortunately, LinkedIn data is highly protected. It's not really possible to utilize LinkedIn data on a large scale. If you have a pro account, as my colleagues here from Australia had, you can get some overview information about individuals and their jobs, but you cannot get the full profile. So this is uh, very much protected. Maybe also one of the reasons why Microsoft acquired the company for I think $26 billion a couple of years ago. This is why we had to stick to Twitter, which again brings in a bias. And so far, I want to be honest with this, obviously, not everyone is on Twitter. I myself, I'm not on Twitter, but I have a personality. Not everyone of you is on Twitter, but you have a personality. So in some of the CEOs, you know, actually employ people to write yes. in Twitter. Absolutely. It's not, it's not their personality. It's actually their employees who will determine how they should project their boss on Twitter. This is another limitation. We have to openly acknowledge this in our study. We try to find out about it and so that we check for actual company accounts. But if there's a PR team behind the individual, we can't do much mm -hmm. of this. On the other hand, we know of very uh, good or bad famous people that clearly write <laughs> their own stuff <laughs> on Twitter. I don't have to <laughs> make any names here from the startup world or beyond. So anyway, there is this uh, tool we use. It's called IBM Watson. It unfortunately doesn't exist anymore, but there's many others. As we are currently preparing the data and code to be shared, we are also preparing like a list of available tools. There's even one, I find it fascinating, but also a bit scary, that you can just um, upload a picture of yourself, portrait more or less, selfie, and it tells you what personality you have. So, okay. <laughs> this, uh, I leave to the community to um, talk about this. And in any case, it gives us the big five personality traits. So just briefly, what are the big five personality traits? They are conscientiousness, agreeableness, extroversion, neuticism, and openness to experience. And the key thing about them is like everyone has, or everyone maps out somewhere on this um, five-dimensional scale. It's not that you have a high value of conscientiousness, let's say close to one, and if you have a value close to zero, it means that this is just less so, but there's always something else. So more conscientious, less conscientious, um, more extroverted, more introverted, more adventurous, less more adventurous, less adventurous. So this roughly is kind of a very standard um, system being used by psychologists and um, um, personality studies. It's like a commonly expressed framework and we just get an understanding of where all these different founders are. And then we use this data plus all the other things we just talked about very importantly to not um, incorrectly assigning personality traits that just so coincide maybe with location or coincide with other factors so that we can actually um, correctly assign the value of personality to a startup success. And just uh, briefly, one more word before we come to our findings on the data collection pipeline in order to just show to you it was a lot of data wrangling in here. So again, we talked about more than 1 million people on Crunchbase, but in the end, we had um, roughly 32,000 founders and a bit more um, data wrangling, removing of duplicates, removing of missing information. And we ended up in the end with 21,000 companies and 25,000 founders that we could utilize for our study. And now I would like to come to the findings, but before that, any questions? Yes. I just wonder how you control for um, the impact of the founder or of the founder on the startup, because there's no control, right? Like the, you can't have a like counterfactual where there is no founder and this is the end. Um, uh, the result of the startup without the powder, and then here is the same startup with the powder. So then, where how do you say that this is where the powder comes in? And um... absolutely good question. So obviously, in a best case scenario, we would do something like a clinical trial where we randomly assign people to start a company or don't start a company, and everything else being 
Equal, we could just say, you know, our random assignment was then the one causing these very different outcomes. So personality was actually the cause. We can't do this here. This is like common among all the social sciences. You are often stuck to observational data as we are here. And in order to correct for this, or in order to get any kind of meaningful inferences, we use um, statistical software, statistical tools, the linear regression model, which is which allows actually to um, look into these various correlations and tries to assess kind of the additional value. But obviously you're absolutely right. It is not the same as if it was an experiment. This is unfortunately not possible here. There's a few ways around for kind of causal inference. We are not deploying this here. We don't want to overstretch the interpretation. Obviously all correlational. And I have also have to say, we gathered this data when the companies already existed. But the main argument here is that the personality largely stays on um, largely stays constant throughout adulthood. There is a few kind of events like traumatic events or significant life events could change the personality. Um, one thing that also changes personality often for the better is the therapy. We don't know when, how far many of these founders were engaged in any of this. So we assume personality stays constant. So we can take current data and then we use only information for the company success measures that have been available by the day the company was founded. Obviously, we would not want to look into any data point that came uh, that became available later because this would then bias other things. So now coming to the oh, sorry, yeah, one more question here. Yeah, yeah oh, sorry. Uh, why did you decide specifically for Big Five and not, for example, MBTI or whatever else? And well, for two reasons. Um, one is the Big Five are uh, like. A standard measure so kind of agreed and loads of research has shown over and over again that they are important metrics of personality and the other they were available with IBM so we could use them with the two we had okay yeah okay now coming to the results just very briefly an overview of the three main findings the first finding is founders are not like most people we compare our founder data set with a different set of employees those people that come from occupations where there is just very few founders, where there is not many startups, in order to compare um, employees and entrepreneurs. And we find founders are different in terms of their personality. Secondly, even though they are a very particular breed out of the overall um, personality landscape, they are not all too similar. There is different personality types. There's, um, according to our statistical analysis we have been using here, there's six different types. And then thirdly, actually founder teams with diverse personality characteristic, they have higher chances of success. So we establish a new form of diversity in addition or on top of the more traditional diversity characteristics that has been looked at dimensions that is obviously gender, race, education and background and so on and so forth. We say there's also on top of it personality diversity that should be looked at in order to highlight team performance and success. And now I would just go through these results with you one by one. So the first finding, founders are not like most people. What we do here on the left-hand side, we compare this data set of entrepreneurs, the um, darker um, shaded um, distribution with this employees, which is this lighter shaded distribution among our five personality traits or among important dimensions here. And what you see is, the distribution covers all the complete um, scale from zero to one. And obviously, pers the personalities of founders um, are also distributed among this whole space. But in contrast to our employees, we see oftentimes they rather kind of cluster here to the extreme. So to summarize, um, founders tend to be more open, more adventurous. They seem to be less modest, so very ambitious people. They have high activity levels, less anxiety, and are relatively trustworthy people in comparison to the overall population, which, no surprise, covers all of these various aspects to some extent. And indeed, just utilizing the personality data, nothing else. So we just use these personality facets, which is, I want to say, the big five traits come with in total 30 facets, so 30 different variables are grouped into these uh, five big categories. Just utilizing this information, we can train a machine learning model that can tell us whether a person is an employee or an entrepreneur with more than 80% accuracy. So something that we thought is pretty cool and interesting finding. So clearly personality and your choice of becoming an, an entrepreneur seems to be in some way associated with one. And then the second finding is that even though these 
founders are already a specific breed, there is actually different types of founders. So we are mapping these 30 different dimensionalities here into just a two-dimensional space using a, a machine learning clustering model, so-called TSME. If you're more interested in this, you can find loads of stuff on it online. And then we apply a clustering algorithm on this reduced dimensionality space. And what turns out is that there are six different types. We gave them titles that we support kind of reflect the different main characteristics of these people, but also in a way that obviously um, there is kind of no hierarchy between them. So, you know, one is clearly better than the other in no way. So we have um, those types. We have accomplishers, leaders, engineers, developers, operators, and fighters. And I have just um, given you as an example, like one of the particularly standing out um, features of those. And, and on the right hand side, you can see um, like a heat map highlighting First of all, you see that all of these founders are quite similar. So they score highly in this bit of the distribution, not so much on others. This would then obviously be for other parts of the population, but still you see certain differences in. So for example, the operator is more like a conscientious type of person. So person with an eye for detail. And in contrast, for example, the engineer scores high on imagination and on intellect. So obviously a person who would rather want maybe to think bigger, what could be done with this very device in terms of developing it to a market ready tool. And then we have the accomplisher, extroverted person, the developer with a high activity level, and so on. So yes. And this small cluster from the bottom left. This um, one here? Yeah, this one. Do you know anything specific about it? We have not looked into this uh, in more detail. We should actually, it's quite interesting. Yeah. And by the way, this um, maybe is a good starting point for just briefly mentioning follow-up research we are planning. So we want to look into the um, team diversity in more detail and exploring the relationship between the various facets. We really try to quantify not only as we are doing here, just assigning person um, unambiguously to these clusters, but more mapping out kind of and how far people are um, or founder teams are diverse and less so. So there's clearly more space to explore this. So, and this is again, kind of roughly speaking, the whole personality landscape of our founders. But now to give this a bit more flesh and maybe to make this a bit um, more tangible, we also did something else. So um, my colleagues from Australia, they created the so-called personality occupation map. So where they went on, got Twitter profiles of individuals from various occupations from across all different job types that you could work on. And they tried to understand and how for personalities, not only within entrepreneurs, but within all kinds of jobs seem to cluster. And then we took our six personality types from the founder group and we assign to them the closest occupational fit to get a better understanding of what kind of a typical person would look like actually working in these jobs so for example the fighter the closest occupation fit is a software developer or computer engineer so someone who would um, maybe um, work with these kind of um, computer related types of jobs and the operator with this um, strong focus on detail and conscientiousness the closest job type would be a bicycle mechanic. Not to say that all these people definitely invent new bicycles or anything new, but rather so that you can understand like what would they like to do. The accomplisher closest map is somewhat more like a manager type, chief information officer type of personality, leader, also executive director, a leadership kind of personalities in there. The engineers, little surprise, closest fit would be engineering jobs, and the developers also not too surprising. Developer kinds of stuff. This is also where we got these titles from. So we see all of these different founder personalities reflect different types of jobs. And indeed, this is also what they actually do in their startups. So as you probably know, in startup, there are certain types of ways to, um, to label the different types of activities people have in, in startups. The most famous one is probably the CEO, chief executive officer. Then we think like the CFO, chief financial officer, Chief Operating Officer, Marketing Officer, and then there's others, Creative Product Officer, Technology Officer, also a very common one. So usually you have at least a CEO and a CTO, so one dealing with the business activities, one dealing with the actual product, and the Chief Information uh, Innovation Officer. So I just picked one um, of our personalities out here, the leader, and I'm plotting to you here the distribution of the personality traits of this character. It is not the most common one, as you can see, the accomplisher and the fighter are the most common ones um, 
among our data set here. So the lead is not the most common one, but still you can see actually there seems to be certain correlation. Again, even though we have inferred the personality from the Twitter data, we have not mapped this in any case, in any way, with that this activity, there seems to be correlation in the sense that leaders, for example, they cluster in jobs like chief executive officer or chief operating officer, and less so in technology innovation officer. <laughs> this might be related actually to the personalities in the sense that leaders score high on agreement. So it's people that are kind of very trustworthy and trust other people. Assertive, altruistic, sympathetic, and friendly kind of individuals. So those, I would like to say probably that rather deal with other individuals, with other people in their jobs in the sense that they might and bring different stakeholders together, that they um, talk with the team, that this is kind of what they're doing more than necessarily focusing just on the product. So there seems to be certain correlation in there. And now coming to the final result, last but not least, is this all just white noise or does it play a role for eventual company success? And we can see, yes, it does so. So while success is driven by various factors, founder personality combinations, are among the most important ones. So I spare you the details of the statistical model, but here what you see is we have um, certain types of data points, variables in our data set from these various groups. So we have personality combinations with the startup age, the personality of founders, the industry, team size, and so on. And the coefficient just quantify how much each of these factors contributes to success. And what you can see here on this visualization on the right is again, these various factors. Whenever the bar is above the uh, horizontal zero line here and the standard deviation is not touching this zero line, you can see this is a statistically significant contribution. And then the higher it is, the more significant, the more substantial the contribution. And what you can see is all these various factors play a role. But if you take everything into account, for example, industry doesn't play much of a role anymore. And this is probably because it is captured by the personality combination. It is captured by... Um, the individual facets or by location, age, and so on and so forth. But throughout the group here, throughout all of this, individual factors, you see personality combinations play a role. And there's certain combinations that seem to be particularly assigned to uh, associated with success. I would not overinterpret this in the sense that, oh, definitely you need two leaders and one developer, or you need two developers and an operator. It's more so to say, if you bring these different people together, this really seems to have an effect. But um, also what plays a role is the fact that startups or making startups successful is a team sport. So startups with more founders tend to be successful. This mm -hmm. is the relative share of successful companies that were founded by just one person, two people, three, and so on. It goes on. So the kind of success share seems to rise across in this space, though I would like to say there is not many companies with six or seven founders. So you see somewhere here in the middle seems to be the sweet spot from three people on what it really starts to make a difference. There's also this colloquial term of the hipster, hustler, and hacker that together make a startup successful. This is something we try to find here. We couldn't find evidence necessary for just this one combination, but diversity in general. And also, as we heard before, it takes time to make a startup successful. So on average, among our successful companies, they needed between six and seven years, but there's also a few companies that needed much longer. And obviously, from our... 21,000 companies, only 3,500 were successful according to our definition. Can I? Yeah, ask you. Uh, maybe I missed this on the now, sorry. But how do you define success here? What is. Yeah, so we talked about it briefly. So, success in our particular, the way we're looking at it is just this exit event. So, exit. company being acquired, company acquired another one, or IPO. Okay. We could have taken others, though they are much harder to measure. For example, one um, that would come to mind is survival. Is the company still active after some time? Great variable. I think it would be absolutely valid to use this, though it is easy to look for whether the company is still being active. But it's much harder to say this company is not active. Because if your company goes bust, would you actually delete the Crunchbase profile? Would you delete the LinkedIn profile? We would have doubts on this, so we um, thought we'd take a more um, specific definition, but clearly others would have been applicable. If these companies were more like um, publicly listed companies where there's a lot of reporting going on, you would look into revenue, profits, costs, whatnot. Unfortunately, this kind of financial data is hardly available for startup companies. Okay, so so this means that 6.3 to 3 years means that uh, 
companies that is acquired or is it was yeah this means like on average among these three and a half thousand companies out of our 21,000 companies that were successful they on average needed between six and seven years to get into one of these exit events okay. yes. so for the unsuccessful firms did you compare between a successful one and unsuccessful one and maybe like use machine learning to predict if the founders are of certain personality types you're spoiling the regard on this slide <laughs> 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 this is exactly what we what we what we were doing here so we're comparing the personality traits of the whole founder team between successful and unsuccessful companies again i want to say no success doesn't mean this is kind of failed company in any sense it's just a company that didn't have an exit event. again follow-up research is clearly needed to build on top of this but what we're doing here is we look at the percentiles of the personality domain among the founder teams and we are measuring the maximum value we're not taking the average for the fact that an average doesn't make sense let's say the three of us start a company mm -hmm. and we have different conscientiousness values zero zero point five one then taking the average 0 0.5 doesn't make sense because in this particular case, you would have the 0 0.5 value, but the two others of us not. So you would need to take the maximum value to reflect that this is the characteristic that this one person actually has from the team. So we look at the big five dimensions here, agreeableness, conscientiousness, extraversion, emotional stability, that is anxiety in this particular case, and openness. And we compare in green, the distribution of the successful companies, and in red, the distribution of the unsuccessful companies. And what you can see is, just by this very um, broad comparison here, not all of these seem to be necessarily statistically significant. Again, this here is obviously not controlling for all the other factors, but a few really seem to play a role or seem to have larger differences. So we see that um, the founder team of successful companies have someone on board who's very conscientious in contrast to um, those who were not successful. Um, were not successful. They have someone extroverted in the team contrast to someone else who is kind of maybe less extroverted and there's less anxious people in the board and then again this comes down to the fact that if we look into the odds ratio that is the um, added probability of becoming successful we see that in comparison to the baseline model which in this particular case would be a company started by just one founder of accomplisher type we see that combinations of for example two leaders and a developer could be up to 12 13 times as successful so really personality plays a role different personality combinations seem to be relevant. And our reasoning behind this is that obviously as having a startup and navigating the startup through all these various pitfalls and all these various traps that might come, that might lie there across the board, across your journey, it is important to have someone on board who can deal with these very things. So you need someone who can talk to external stakeholders. You need someone who can actually do the product development and all these various other complex activities. So this is why we are saying personality diversity matters. And just one brief outline in, into how good is our model actually. So we're comparing it here with a random draw baseline model. So we're not just saying this plays a role because we obviously would need to compare to something else. And maybe a bit naive, but actually um, often applied strategy would just to randomly draw, randomly invest in companies. This is often what venture capital firms do. They just bet on various companies and hope that a few of them actually become successful. So how good would um, be a model that just randomly picked companies from our data set? It would have 15% accuracy. So we would then be able to identify out of 100 eventual successful companies, 15 out of them. And in contrast to this, our model has a um, recall accuracy of 37%. That means, I made an example here, so out of 100 eventually successful companies, our model would identify 37 of them, just utilizing data that was available by the day the company was founded, plus personality information and combinations compared to a baseline model. So if you invested into kind of this standard portfolio, for example, you would have 133 successful companies in your portfolio at the end. And in comparison, we would have 319 here with our data set. But I don't want to hide uh, from you. There's also other factors. We are uh, training all of this on historical data. So we use observational data. So there's loads of historical biases in there. We heard about gender, for example, gender playing a role in the sense that clearly there's different personality type associated with it. There's also different viewpoints and experiences coming with it. And um, one analysis we have in the supplementary information of our paper is we also added gender as we have it here. And it looks like the um, 
performance of the uh, predictive model becomes better. Yes, it becomes better, but unfortunately, exactly in the way we wouldn't want it to happen. This is because of historical biases in the data. It used to be a male-dominated startup ecosystem over the past 20, 30 years that we are looking at the data. That means companies with female founders had a lower chance of becoming successful. So including it in the model clearly helps to make the model better, but unfortunately, this is just perpetuating existing imbalance. So this is something we also want to say here out loud. It's not, please just copy this and invest in just these companies, <laughs> but be aware, get transparency about all these various factors that are actually maybe implicitly or intra intransparently playing a role and account for all of those, and then make an open and honest assessment. And to summarize, what do we find? Or what's the takeaway? First, um, it is important to acknowledge the role of personality diversity as a driver of team performance and success. And you could also then obviously utilize our findings, first of all, to predict startup success. Again, becoming aware of all the biases, of all the intransparencies that so far have not been quantified. Think about it. Then secondly, you could use all of this to incorporate the occupation personality fit that we developed here to and help people guiding their careers, maybe thinking about what kind of job would fit to you, what kind of job actually suits to your personality, which might be very different from what your parents might have said you should do or what um, people on Instagram or social media or elsewhere might imply to be the best job for you. Rather look at your own personality and obviously think of personality diversity in bringing teams together for improved performance. And this is it from my side and just the last Comment if you're interested in our research, if you want to maybe contribute to this, mm -hmm. we're currently hiring a research mm -hmm. assistant application that is tomorrow noon. So please have fun. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. So I think we've got probably what, about 20 minutes or so for questions. Is that, is that okay for you? Um, so obviously we can take questions from the room. Mm -hmm. And if we can also just keep an eye on questions coming up in the chat. Are you okay? Picking the questions yourself. Yes, absolutely, here. absolutely, yes. It's challenges that young people face. I've got the job market and it's changing faster than ever. So there's a summary of that. There is. I'm not sure what I think there in your talk, but anyway. <laughs> okay, yeah, then maybe we start in the room, yeah. yeah uh, would you mind to go back to the slides for the percentile scores of personality traits? Mm -hmm. hmm? uh, no, the one before with the correlation. Even further back, sorry. <laughs> yes, that one. Um, I'm just curious to know, um, it seems to be there's quite a bit of dis discrepancy between entrepreneurs and employees for the anxiety um, anxiety mm -hmm. measurements. And I'm curious to know what's happened there. Um, if you can tell us. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say, um, if you look at this, I'd say roughly normally evenly distributed across the whole space. If you look at the lower part of the employees, mm -hmm. So there is people who are more anxious. There's people who are less anxious. Just, you know, nothing good or bad about it. And just the entrepreneurs just seem to score lower on anxiety. So just in with anxiety, for example, it is one of these traits where they clearly dip, are distinctive from the older population. So I think this is what's going on there. So this same happens with the other um, with the other factors too, but I think that is just very pronounced, the difference. Okay. How about the differences between modesty and trust? They seem to be on the opposite side of each other for the great moments. Um, you're talking about modesty and trust, yeah. So this is um, just, um, um, yeah, so this is just because people, I think they're, and again, it, this this depends really on how, it, from which perspective you want to read these. So you could look at it from perspective so from the right side or from the left side. So there's, again, nothing good or bad about it. It's not that, you know, zero means it's not there and one means that it is. It is more pronounced, but I think they're modestly the opposite. I think ambitious and ambitious and how far people are not modest and how far they are very ambitious. And um, this is just, you know, they are not that modest, but with trust, clearly it is um, trust. This is, by the way, a research field in its own right. Uh, with also my colleagues and me have done some research in the past about social capital and trust. And it turns out that just not everyone tr um, trusts other people to the same extent, maybe even to the extent of naivety, maybe. And the entrepreneurs are clearly scoring their very so is that high. how much you how much these individuals trust others? Yes. How trustworthy they yeah. are. Yeah. But by the way, how much you trust others is the perfect predictor of how trustworthy you are. So very interesting question. If the mm. so-called generalized trust question, which goes mm. like on a scale from zero to ten, how much do you trust people? With zero meaning you can't be too careful, and ten meaning 
um, it's good to trust people in general. And you can ask people, and I I sometimes do this if I you know <laughs> when you meet new people, and of course important not to anchor it yourself. So just ask them, and some people will say, oh yeah, I think I'm a very trustworthy person or very trusting person. Let's say five, but actually. Um, High trust starts with eight. Or so. so this actually tells you a lot about uh, also how, again, obviously, skeptics do that. Again, one should not overinterpret this, but um, an interesting field in its own right. Would you say that, oh, I'm so yeah. sorry. Would you say that just looking at this graph itself, it means that actually employees and entrepreneurs are not that different except on the level of anxiety? No, I'd, I'd say they are pretty much different. They are, um, if I can express it in statistical terms, they are. <laughs> they are so different that the machine learning model, the utility, actually various machine learning models, we have trained several of them that they, on average, like it can predict um, differences between the two just based on the personalities with more than 80% accuracy. So there is, um, of course, you can't see it here necessarily, but if you take all these individuals into account, also you have to, um, you have to see that it's not one person here in our modesty scale. So the, the same person is here, 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 and in all these colors. So it is like in all these 30 dimensions, of course, we can't display 30 dimensions here, but if you were to imagine like this hugely 30 dimensional space, these data points, that is the individuals and the personalities are just very different. Yeah. So you um, took exit as the um, the measure of success, which yes. makes complete sense because it stops you from having to worry about people who are in transit towards their exit point. But for those sorts of companies, um, say charities or what bankers would call the living dead, you know, those ones that have, that have social impact or have longevity in terms of their dynasty and but they're, and they're producing a product that everyone wants and everybody's happy with. Um, what's your hypothesis with regards to those kinds of people that start those kind, whether it's charity or, or something that doesn't want to exit? And, and make a lot of money. Yeah. Is it is would would you what would your hypothesis be about that personality grouping? I would like to be cautious about this and just refer to follow up research that is needed there. Yeah. We haven't done this, so I don't want to speculate just based on our exit focus study here on how these personalities would look like. But clearly, it's something we actually plan with this um, project going on. as you know becoming mm -hmm. a project here, a research project here, the Oxford Internet Institute is one of these dimensions we want to look at, as well as others. We talked about gender, we talked about occupations, mm -hmm. we talked about various, let's say, decisions about potential entrepreneurship or just decisions for certain careers. And this is something we would want to look at. And this is maybe if I can um, spoil this so far from the planned um, research we want to do, we are about to create an interactive quiz where we would want to make this whole research here more applicable so that people can get a shortened survey obviously no one wants to sit there for hours and ask 300 questions but it could be maybe even with seven questions already maybe we go for 15 or so like a, a number of questions that is kind of definitely doable and ask people about um, other aspects of the like the educational background where they're coming from maybe if um, ethically possible about their linkedin or crunchbase profile if they're entrepreneurs to also understand in how far people might be thinking of going into entrepreneurship and then develop this whole journey or whether they're happy with the current job, asking them for the occupation, these kind of things. So there's more questions actually that came up than mm -hmm. the one question we can answer here, the three questions we can answer here, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. You kind of started answering this, but I just wanted to ask what you envision the next steps to be and also whether the same kind of database could be scraped from Twitter now with the new like API restrictions. So if you yeah. want to recreate. Yeah. Um, a good question. I uh, starting with the second one. I don't know about the API restrictions so far. Um, would be interesting to know. Uh, but clearly, I think this all points to the fact that more accurate and more data should be gathered, and needs to, of course, always in an ethical way, needs to be made available to the researching community so to understand all of these to make things transparent. So we just talked about this interactive quiz, and also what we would want to do. We want to utilize the survey, so we are obviously interested in making this quiz available so that people can actually use it maybe to guide their own careers, to uh, guide their potential um, search for team partners when they want to open a company. Again, we always want to make sure, please don't overinterpret this result and just not take this person into account because it's not a developer, an operator or whatnot, but become aware of this. And then with the survey, we would want to fine tune this. So in, the hope is that we could actually, if we also got social media data from these individuals in the sense that they would link their profile to the survey, but they answer these questions. So then we would get kind of um, ground truth data about their personality. We could understand in how far does the social media influence actually work. 
And I think most interestingly, we are partnering with an institution in uh, Heilbronn with the TU Munich, and they have um, there at this um, campus in Heilbronn, they have their own kind of startup hub where they, over the years, of course, have already supported a number of um, a large number of startup companies and founders in various aspects. So we could, um, we actually in, the, in um, communication with them about partnering up with them, understanding what various kind of um, maybe decisions this um, startup hub has been taken to support these companies, what performance or success metrics are there, which could then be different than exit, and then how for all of this plays out, maybe in foundation of companies are forming and then distributing the survey just to all people of this um, ecosystem to really understand what is going on there in this uh, larger field. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I was just wondering to what extent maybe openness and um, anxiety levels are also due to the fact that um, these people are on Twitter or active on X. So it, can, you, can you actually like uh, statistically um, look out for that? I'm not sure. And with the data set we have, unfortunately not, because we just have people from Twitter with the um, additional data uh, data collection that we're going to have cleared. And we would like to go away from it. And I think the future is then, even though I'm obviously as a data scientist, a big fan of big data and available data sets and observational data, but still I think the future here is using service to get better data or um, a variety of text data maybe to infer this person. I think that not necessarily already have this kind of big pre-requirement you need to be like a social media thing kind of person. It's something you want to consult. Abdullah, you had a question too. So, um, so you mentioned that all of your work is now uh, open source and so on, right? Like, so do you worry or think about people using this as a tool and like selling it to VCs being like, okay, we have this lovely tool which you can gauge the startup is going to be successful or not? Yeah, yeah, this is seems to be in the air already. So we were approached after the publication of this study that many people are already working on it. And I have to say, I don't want to hide this. Another study was published just um, five months before ours that was already doing something very similar. This sometimes happened. You know, the teams just um, independently work on the very same question. Um, again, what we're going to do in publishing the results, we make sure that everything is anonymized, everything is synthesized in a way that no one can actually infer anything back on this very individual. Uh, but at the same time, we just also want to support the replicability of the findings here and open science in general. So clearly people could use this and this is something we would want to we would want to encourage. Of course, we cannot, we as researchers, as scientists cannot do more than just claiming and stating in our paper, this is all the very spice and this is all the remark that are important to keep in mind. But I think the, the technology is out there. It just so happened that researchers were the first in this case to publish it. Um, and from what we have heard that the start of the approaches. I don't know, maybe this is a very biased sample. Um, and those who are already applying this or the VCs, um, they haven't been in touch. But from my feeling from these various conversations we had with VCs is that so far, even though um, think about how much money is involved in all this and kind of how important it is to be um, performed better than your competitors, it seems to be not that data driven yet just because probably there's a big labor shortage with regards to data scientists. So there is not that many people actually available who would then maybe in an environment like a VC necessarily apply their skills as there's plenty of other job opportunities. So from what we heard, there is more a few Excel spreadsheets and people, uh, let's say, triangulating, um, let's say, being informed by data rather than necessarily doing data science there. But this is clearly on the rise, yeah. Shameless plug on this point, if I may. Oxford um, Seed Fund here and we are very interested in this kind of stuff so <laughs> also if you're looking for funding please tell me about this <laughs> thank you any online uh, questions I yeah online so questions yeah there's a few there's a few comments here let me just check them so we have if you have any questions please add them how important is having a founders agreement where there are at least two or more co-founders key to long-term success of the startup um i think agree agreement what does agreement mean agreeableness then we just showed this um last the theme in the research would there be research on this webinar available somewhere Rec record yeah record you said is available right? yes it'll be put on the oi website and i think anybody who signed up will be notified when it goes out okay so the um, record will be available and then i was answered it. already and then thanks Thank so you. no more questions yeah well yeah, oh, yeah. sorry um were you able to have interviews with some of these founders to i don't know like verify those traits that you have listed um and when you have those interviews like what kind of questions do you ask to that kind of tease out like are they actually inventors? Because so as as we have talked about the seed fund, um, 
we are the student-led venture capital fund here and we invest in very early stage. And so a lot of the emphasis is on founders. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very difficult in practice um, for us to actually figure out, are these founders adventurous or less anxious <laughs> for the qualities that you have listed? Um, in your interactions with the co-founders, like what are some of the things that you asked and you're able to like tease out for the street? Yeah. This is, uh, I want to be honest, uh, I want to be honest, obviously this is um, for our um, follow-up research now, interacting with this actual um, kind of startup hub and the people around this. So this is what we want to find out based on the survey. Again, here we had to use the data that was available. So a chance, you know, if we, let's say, work with one particular organization to have many people from this group covered would be relatively low, given that it's like a global data set that we looked at. So this is something we uh, want to understand. But I want to clearly say again that um, I think it would be very important if one wanted to apply this yeah. in supporting certain founders and um, others. I would first of all say use it as a tool to guide, to inform more than you will not be successful. This is not. Yeah. This would then be exactly um, the wrong interpretation that has been applied a lot in finance. You have heard probably about these kind of mortgage and um, credit um, default um, systems, where obviously loads of things um, are at play. All these biases. The same with policing. You know, if you send more policemen to areas where you suspect predictively that there's a lot of crime going on, you will find a lot of crime because people will just start searching for it. So one needs to be very careful not to um, mix up cause and effect. Also one reason why we haven't looked and why we haven't done any of these cause and inference because I think they get the wrong impression of what's actually going on. It is correlational, but it is important then to become aware of this. And maybe when while you start a company, not just say, yeah, you know what? We all studied together in the same business school or we studied together in the same engineering class or I take an engineer, I take an, um, a business person to it, but rather also think, hey, what are the different types of um, personalities, maybe utilizing this occupation map that um, is to be published too soon to understand this is the kind of processes I as a person would like to deal with because in the startup, you will find all of them. Mm -hmm. Obviously, at various stages of your startup, you will have more or less of them. When you just start the company, maybe just the three people of you, so you just need to talk with two others, but in the future, then you might have um, a leading role. This is something actually we talked about, we heard about already, that some people have difficulty then to transition from this, um, let's say, more operative role, actually working with the product and bringing it to market, then to transition more to a manager role. So this is the thing where the breaking points come in, where we would hope to find out more about how all of this goes together. Yeah, thank you. Yes, do we have time? I think we have we have to come um, to an end, right, in the next... I think probably we have one more question. Maybe. One more question, then. The last word. Um, yeah. I'll ask you the question the founders are getting asked too many times. What do you hope to achieve with all this? I mean, you said some next steps, uh, like with like you know the limitations, you know stuff you want to explore, but like in general, your mission is what with this sort of research? Yeah, I definitely want to bring this to the market and have my own startup company with it. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, joking. No. <laughs> to be honest, I mean, if you ask me like this, I want to be honest. You know, I'm a really a social data science, a computational social science, a complexity researcher by heart. I think this is important. I, um, like as many people, are interested in personality, psychology. This is just a subject that I think many, many people out there just like. And um, I'm fascinated by the idea that we can quantify this and we can quantify a previously kind of largely unquantified important aspect of um of the world, namely the whole startup atmosphere and ecosystem, and contribute in a meaningful way with the tools that are available here for us as social data scientists in combination with others. So I think it's a fascinating research field. And hopefully, of course, it would be possible to make change. This is why we want to publish the data, anonymize and the code so that people can actually apply it. And if it helps um, someone to find the job that actually fits to their personality, uh, be a bit more happy with, the, with their job shop choice, or if it helps a startup to form, I think this is all something that would really be great to achieve with this research. So I think some real world impact and understanding of yeah, the world. Amazing. Thank you, Fabian. Thank you so much. It's such a fascinating area. And I, I really think the insights you're developing, as you say, in a scientific, using the scientific method are so, so valuable. And uh, thank you also, all of you, for your great questions. It's been a fab seminar. I'm so happy to show our appreciation to Fabian, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.